Hello, 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 welcome, welcome to this space in the midst of Facebook land, wherever you happen to be, wherever you happen to be, my name is Kendra Kunoff, where I happen to be, it's February 20th, Thursday, February 20th. Approximately 11.31 a.m. on the west coast of California. And welcome to those who are joining live. Welcome to those who are watching the replay. Whether you're here live or whether you're watching the replay, I very much uh, welcome your engagement, your shares, your questions, your responses, your agreement, your disagreement, your curiosity. So if you're live, I'll try to do my best to stay engaged with the comments and make this a little bit of a conversation, such as it can be. Welcome, nice to see your voices or your, your, your names and faces popping up. If you're here in the replay, I love getting to know who's actually watching the replay. You can just let me know you're here. Um, if you have a question, a share, a comment, an agreement, a disagreement. <laughs> it's just helpful for you to give me a little context because I'm not here live to know what I'm talking about in the moment. So here we are diving in. Welcome, welcome to those who are joining. First and foremost, I sort of wish I didn't have to say this anymore. I'm using the language of male and female. I'm using the language of masculine and feminine because it is alive in our culture today. And so I think there's value in using the language that's alive. And this piece that I want to bring today around really distinguishing between female leadership and feminine leadership um, is alive in me largely because of conversations that I see happening or uh, posts that grab my attention or um, marketing for courses that are all about feminine leadership or that I believe are merging the two. And uh, something that calls to me in truly distinguishing that. And I think that really comes down to me to a deep, deep value I have around choice. I think when we don't distinguish things and we just go like, bleh, they're the same, when they're not really the same, that we lose the opportunity for choice. And to me, choice is such a fulcrum point in terms of our own power and all the ways that that uh, can display. So welcome to the conversation in distinguishing between female and feminine leadership. And so I am gonna use this language of male and female, man, woman, masculine, feminine. And so at the outset, I always have to say, and I try to repeat myself throughout because I know that people will join in the middle and won't have heard me say it here at the beginning, but feminine does not equal female, and female does not equal feminine, and masculine does not equal male, and male does not equal masculine, and man does not equal masculine, and woman does not equal feminine. And um, what is really tricky about this and why it's, it's both so important to distinguish these and to say over and over and over again that female or woman does not inherently equal feminine and that male or man does not inherently equal masculine is because there are these places of overlap. That there is a truth that both the masculine perspective, it's not even a perspective, I wouldn't say it's the masculine perspective, like the male uh, perspective has dominated for the last however many centuries. And masculine qualities, especially in the realms of what we tend to call leadership or what is highly valued in the way that we value things, currently in the world today in terms of praise and success and money and accolades that masculine traits have been uh, um, more heavily weighted 
in those. And there are certainly there are slices, of course. There's always gonna be someone who's like, what about you know Beyonce? <laughs> or what about there are absolutely women who are highly rewarded, both in terms of success or fame or money in the world today. But if we really look globally and we really like look at the statistics and we really look at numbers and we really look, you know, it's pretty hard to deny, although I'm sure people will, maybe even on this video, <laughs> see if we can have a fight about it, that both the male experience and the male perspective as well as the masculine traits have been more heavily weighted, more heavily valued culturally, you know, over the course of however many last centuries. I, I was, you know, maybe going to like do some research and be like, how many, how long? And I was like, you know what, I'm not even going to get into the realm of trying to, you know, fact pick it out here. So it makes sense that when people talk about that, that there's simultaneously a conversation of like, we need more women's voices and the feminine perspective is, is being highlighted. Um, and ultimately there's a call for the feminine experience and the feminine traits to be equally valued, valued equally valuable. Uh, but those two things often then get mapped over to each other when they're not the same thing. And what I really believe is that it's not that I believe that we need the feminine uh, traits more or that the feminine traits are more valuable or that women's perspectives, the, the, the female experience is more valuable. It's simply that it, it has been so much less magnified. It's been backburnered for so long that it often seems like it's all about pushing women to the forefront right now. And, and there's sort of a what about me that can come from the, from males or from the masculine perspective. And I've talked about that in other places. But that I do believe that, that and I, and I want to talk about masculine and feminine traits in a moment and really talk about it in the realm of um, how valuable they both are. However, when I go through and, and list these out, I think you'll often see that there is this way that what falls under the masculine, you know, column, to the masculine side of the column, tend, we tend to be like, oh yeah, that, that's leadership, or that's important, or that's valuable, or we need that in companies, or banks, or in big business, or um, politics, all the places that we sort of say, these are the important areas of leadership, these are the people who we need to follow, who are going to make policy, who are going to impact, you know, the global economy or the world or what have you, that these are the things that are most valued there. And I just am, want to highlight that I believe that the feminine perspective is also important. So it's not that I actually want less of the masculine perspective. It's that I want to highlight more of the feminine uh, traits or I'm trying to think like what there's a better word for it than that. And I also do believe, and this is one of those tricky places where it gets mapped over. Like I said at the beginning, not only have the masculine traits been, I would say, wait, I don't, I don't want to say overvalued. It's more like weighted, overweighted in value because I think they should be valued as highly as they're valued. The masculine traits should be valued that highly and the feminine traits should be valued that highly. <laughs> And it's hard to see, like, how can that happen? How can we have the feminine traits valued so much if we don't take away from the masculine traits? And it's like we, we believe, you know, everything's like a pie. And if you take a slice out of the pie, there's just less pie. And life just isn't like that. Even success and money and resources and like, yes, even when they're sort of finite, it's not they don't really have to compete with each other. It's just how do we bring them both? And you know, it is true. So women and females make up at least 51% of the global population. And the story, the experience, the perspective, like the lived experience of walking through the world in a female body has not had as loud of a voice. 
has not had the kind of magnification that the lived experience of walking through the world in a male body has. And I know that it often doesn't seem like that because it's not like, oh, it's just being you know magnified or blasted out, but we tend to consider the male experience the norm. And the female experience is, even if we don't think it's quote abnormal, it's the difference. It's what we see in highlight to the norm, which is the male experience. This is what it's like to move through the world. This is what it's like to be a human. We see it incredibly distinctly in medicine, where medicine is made for men and male bodies. And then we're like, oh, there's like this problem that women's bodies work differently rather than we would never think that the that the female body should be the norm and that's how all medicine should be studied and that we should just diagnose and give medicine to men based on research for women. It happens all the time in the other direction, all the time. <laughs> and so that's just one example. So there is this truth that I actually believe whether a woman or a female is animating the masculine or the feminine, we actually need more women and more females in leadership also. And I, and I believe that those are both true. It's not just, oh, we need more women animating the feminine in leadership, which is just another sexist trope. I have a whole thing about that. Like, it's just another way to say that women and females basically shouldn't be masculine. <laughs> so I believe that we need women animating their feminine and animating their masculine. We need whole whole women and we need whole men in leadership and that means men that are also animating both their masculine and their feminine and so I guess what I mean ultimately my my ultimate desire would be for whole human beings to be in leadership and because we have such a backlog in terms of having so much of the male perspective and male leadership at like front and center that I actually think we do need just more females, more women, because that is a perspective. Like there is a difference of what it is to move through the world, to have navigated the world in a female body. And that perspective needs to come out more front and center so that we just know what it is so that it's not seen as the difference to the norm, which is whatever it is to walk through the world as a male or in a man's body. So I believe those things are both true. Another piece that I um, that is so important to this conversation is that what we consider to be so often what I just hear is like the masculine, the feminine. Like we've had too much masculine, now we need the feminine. And frankly, like there's there's a way in which at the very surface that's true. But what I believe is more true is that so much of again in these last I don't know, two centuries, five centuries, somewhere in like in these last several centuries, a lot of what has taken front and center stage is more along the lines of what we would call toxic masculinity. It's less healthy, it's less mature, it's less connected to the sacred. And that is now being branded masculine. And so it has this huge pendulum swing that's just like all the feminine all the time. And not only does the feminine have an absolutely equally um, violent, hurtful, you know, sort of dangerous, immature, self-centered, um, less healthy side to it. But it really doesn't do a dis it does a disservice to the wholeness of, of masculine uh, traits to only look at like controlling, dominating, um, rigid, discriminative, like all of these qualities as masculine and to sort of call it like, like that's the masculine and we've had too much of, of like that. What we've had too much of is the unhealthy masculine, the, the controlling, the dominating, the unfeeling, you know, the, especially it's the masculine completely dissociated from the feminine, but it's also this thread you know, that is an unhealthy, immature thread of the masculine, and there is an equally unhealthy, immature thread of the feminine. <laughs> so I'm not spending like a whole ton of time on that, but it's important to remember that toxic masculinity is not equal to masculinity. 
So once again, before I start diving into masculine and feminine here, for those of you who joined after my you know, rant slash spiel at the beginning, that it's super important to remember always, always, always that feminine does not equal female, that woman does not equal feminine, that masculine does not equal male, that man does not equal masculine. Feminine and masculine are energetics. They're a way of describing energetics that exist in the universe. And it's only one way of describing them. And there's an absolutely valid point of like, why do we even use the words masculine and feminine? Because they so easily map over to man and woman. And I am using them right now because they are uh, descriptors that are so alive in the culture right now. And so I actually want to use them in service of distinguishing what I believe they are and what they're not. So when we think about, uh, these are both, well, first I want to just sort of talk about high level. And again, if you're here live and at any point you have a question, a share, something that resonates, something that doesn't resonate, like pop it in the chat so that we can have, you know, I want to know for sure if, if I'm not speaking clearly, if I'm not making sense, if there's something you disagree with, like let's, let's actually dialogue about it because this is an important conversation to be having right now. So if you're here live, absolutely engage. If you're watching the replay, give me a little context, but leave your comments in the chat so I can come back and dialogue. But at the highest level, or the most kind of, I don't mean that highest, like best, I just mean like at the, at the you know, the most bird's eye view. If we're going to talk about, you know, masculine is consciousness, the awareness, witness, right? These are different ways of saying something that are very, very similar. And the feminine is energy. Uh, the masculine is structure. And the feminine is flow. The masculine is emptiness. And the feminine is form. The masculine is the container. And the feminine is whatever fills that container. <laughs> so it's sort of like the, 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 the container or that in which in which things occur that would be the masculine and the feminine is everything else everything that is occurring so that's at that very kind of high level right drop down just a little bit you could say the masculine is the energy of freedom liberation energy and the feminine is uh connect is is it's kind of connection, but it's more like interconnectedness is the energy of the interplay, the interconnectedness. Um, the masculine is on the side of agency, right? Selfhood, self-determination, agency. And the feminine is on the side of communion, the we. Again, that's the interconnectedness. Neither one of these is more true they're both true at the same time, right? Agency exists, communion exists. Agency is important, communion is important. And it's in a given moment, one might be more called for than the other. But overall, it's not that more agency is better or more communion is better. It's the capacity to actually know which is which and which is called for in any given moment. But again, back to my rant at the beginning is that the, for instance, just to take agency as a, as an energetic is that, especially like if you want to talk about the United States, right. And pulling yourself up by your bootstraps and like, uh, self-determination and the American dream are all based on the energetic of agency, self-determination, that you can do it for yourself, that it's on you, that, that, and that has been valued really since people began to colonize the United States. You know, again, I don't even, I don't, I don't want to get too deep into history because I will absolutely <laughs> fall on my ass somewhere along the line and be totally inaccurate. But you can see the way that that has been valued and that even as maybe other things have been brought in, often the energetic of agency will be overvalued in relation to communion. That, that the energy of communion will be seen as a weakness, whereas the energy of agency will be seen as a strength, rather than what is the strength of either one. 
And then of course, it's just human nature is sort of prone to the pendulum swing. So it, as soon as somebody sees the, uh, the, how that's been played out, they'll want to say, oh, well, agency has a weakness too, rather than just looking towards what is the strength of communion? What is the strength of agency? What is the strength of communion? What is the strength of freedom or liberation energy? And what is the strength of interdependent energy, the energy that looks towards our interdependence? And how can these energies um, dance together? Like how can they, how can the energies, you know, let alone human beings, but how can these energies kind of like fuck each other in a way that creates more beauty? in the world <laughs> and how can this happen then in the realms of leadership so i want to i actually forgot i wanted to read this piece because i do believe that this is this goes back to what i was saying so i want to talk more about masculine feminine but there is this way that i want to say even 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 just in the realm of male and female i do believe that there is there it, we have a need for more female voices and more female leadership as well because the female experience also has been undervalued or sort of pushed to the side. There's this, I just think this is a fantastic book. If you don't know it already, it's called Wolfpack. It's by Abby Wombach. I think you say Wombach or Wombach. I'm not sure. And it's super short. I read it in like, I don't know, 30 minutes or something. So it's a super easy read. And I, I think anybody who's in the realm of leadership, self-development should read it. <laughs> um, and so she says at the beginning, the, I won't read the whole, the whole piece in here, but she, she basically says, recently on a call with a company hiring me to teach about leadership, a man said, excuse me, Abby, I just need to ensure that what you're going to present is applicable to men too. I said, good question but only if you've asked every male speaker you've hired if this message is applicable to women too. And so inside that, again, this doesn't have to become like a big ranty fight thing, but inside that you can see that from however long, but you know, even now, every single day, there are men going into companies teaching leadership development to men and women, and nobody's asking them if what they're teaching is applicable to women because it's assumed that the male experience is the norm. And that whatever leadership comes, you know, whatever these teachings that come through a man are the norm. But if a teaching comes through a woman, it's woman's leadership or female leadership or feminine leadership. And it might or might not be applicable to men. And this part, I think, is so important. And I believe this actually calls men into, uh, I don't know, it actually calls them into a more powerful place. She says, women have had to find themselves within content presented from the male perspective forever. It's essential to flip this and allow men, right? Not force men, not demand men. Allow men the opportunity to find themselves within content presented from a woman's perspective. This actually calls for something from men that will develop them as better leaders. When, and this is true about all humans, but in the perspective between males and females, men and women, women forever, like she says, it's probably not forever, but for a very long time, women have had to develop this muscle of finding ourselves within male content. And that I believe has actually made us better leaders. So it's not that we shouldn't have to do that, but what will, what will be created, what will actually be developed in men when they are allowed the opportunity to find themselves within the stories that are told by women, within content that is developed by women, that comes from the female perspective, will actually, I believe it will develop a strength that is probably somewhat atrophied in many males, not all. The same is true for, um, I'm just going to say very broadly and try not to get into like just totally step in shit here, but you know, white people in terms of the perspectives of people of black people and people of color, indigenous, that there, that those are, that the experience of white people is, is assumed as the norm. And that for the most part, we have not had to find ourselves in perspectives that are being offered by 
black indigenous and other people of color and so that muscle has atrophied like going like oh what do i need to do to find myself within that not like oh that doesn't apply to me because that's leadership for you know black indigenous and people of color like that's bullshit that's just leadership content or that's you know relationship content or that's it's not it's not specific to black indigenous people of color and so in any way when we have to broaden our awareness and find ourselves within things that are not automatically ours, we actually become more whole humans. We become richer, deeper, uh, more beautiful humans. We become better leaders inside of that. So there's that. Um, yeah, Steph, she said, I love Abby's take on applicable to men, and it's such a great response. This book is, if you haven't read this stuff, like, I hope that you read it. And I, I mean, I, again, it's one of those things, it's like, I hope every woman reads this book, but I actually hope every man reads this book. There's a few, so I'll just pause here and say there's three specific books that are written by women that I keep thinking, like, oh, I actually think every man who teaches in the realm of self-development uh, leadership, etc., should read these books because again, it sort of forces like, how do we not just shunt this into, oh, this is like women's leadership, but how do we broaden this out into like, this is leadership development? So, Abby Wombach's, is it Wombach or Wombach? I don't know. Wolfpack, um, The Art of Asking by Amanda Palmer, and a book that I just read, which I believe is called No Walls and the Reoccurring Dream by Ani DeFranco. So three like powerhouse leaders who are all are women who wrote books that basically speak to their experience of being women in the world. Super valuable for both men and women to read these stories to be to be because we are steeped in what it is to be a leader in the world in a male body or as men. So there you go. Okay, so stepping back into this realm, I went really high level in terms of from my framework and my perspective, masculine and feminine. So masculine being consciousness, feminine being energy in a male or a female body. Uh, masculine being structure, feminine being flow, masculine being emptiness or stillness, feminine being form, movement. Um, uh, masculine being the container, feminine being whatever whatever is inside the container, whatever fills it. So at the broadest level, that's the masculine being that in which uh, anything it is or is occurring, and the feminine being whatever is or is occurring, right? Like everything else. Everything is happening inside that in which it occurs. Masculine being freedom, Feminine being interdependence. Uh, masculine being agency, feminine being communion. These are energies, right? These are energies. These, these occur in male bodies, in female bodies, in, in humans that don't identify as either male or female. These, these energies exist, and they exist in the world outside of, they exist in the world outside of humans. <laughs> But we're very human centric. So we talk about humans. So in terms of leadership, I want to talk about if we look at masculine uh, leadership is more focused and one pointed. Feminine leadership has a more broad focus and a more disparate attention. Part of what that lends itself to is that masculine leadership is more goal oriented whereas feminine leadership is more um i want i want to say connection oriented but what i don't mean i don't necessarily mean like oh let's all get connected but there is the outcome so this would be another one it would be like masculine is um completion oriented and feminine is process oriented so the destination or the journey and I mean again we like to we like to now just say like one is better than the other we're always and it's just a very like limited framework to always be saying um, that it's one or the other and that one is better than the other like to always kind of be needing even even when we go into the journey is more important than the destination 
it's sort of like, well, no, I mean, where you end up actually does matter. But if you only focus on where you end up, then a lot is lost. And that's, that's sort of this desire to um, highlight the more feminine perspective that the journey is also important. But we don't need to negate that where we end up is also important. <laughs> And this, so either or actually is a more masculine perspective and both and is a more feminine perspective. Um, knowing, it's sort of like the clarity of knowing is a more masculine energetic and not necessarily like confusion or not knowing, but curiosity living in the realm of what if I didn't know and can I get curious, more feminine energy, more feminine form of leadership. Ma more masculine would be the holding and the guiding, and more feminine is the feeling and the sensing. Um, this goes a little bit with the goal-oriented and the process oriented, but more masculine leadership comes from like, where are we and where do we want to go? More feminine is the space between, like the threads. How, do, how does this all connect? What is this process? And so again, I mean, one of the things I will say is that the feminine in general uh, is less efficient. And so again, you can kind of see like efficiency tends to have been more highly valued, especially in the realms of leadership. Efficiency, like how can we, you know, what's efficient? How can we get this done? Come on, can't you just like, and, um, and efficiency is really important. Efficiency, it's not always the most effective in the broadest sense. So, and it's not necessarily that the feminine perspective is more effective either, but again, I think that actually the weaving of the two, the understanding the value of either one is then where we can find what is truly most effective. So efficiency, the fastest way to do something is not actually always the most effective way to do something. Stuff. Uh, so Kamal said, can I write these books at the end? Yes, I will put the name of those three books in the comments. Thank you for asking. Steph said, yeah, I've started to be able to feel that difference in myself. Completion focus, focused versus process focused. Learning to hold both without that better than attitude. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's a challenge, you know? I think this is like, the fun for me though is like, this is the challenge of our times. And I, um, but of course, actually, I like, so I have like more feminine tendency. So for me, like the tussle with the challenge, I'm like, this is awesome. Like we could just, we could, we could be in this challenge for the rest of our lives. And like, what more worthy thing could there be? And anyone who's watching, who's a little bit more like masculine oriented is going to be like, oh my God, is there ever a fucking end to this? Like, do we, is there an end? Like, is there a completion or like, is there a solution to this? And it's, again, it's yes and. And, I'm, and I may not be the best person to answer that question because I'm like, well, yes and no. So the masculine in leadership or in creation or um, in business, if you will, is going to be more focused on the thing itself. And the feminine is going to be more focused on the energetic. What does that feel like? What is the, what is the actual energetic of so there's being focused on the meeting like or you know like what are we going to accomplish in this meeting or like the people in the meeting or the length of the, meeting, the structure of the meeting and then there's like what does the meeting feel like um there's the product and there's like what is the energetic of the product um the masculine is more focused on thought this again this goes with like knowing uh, data that can be maybe this is maybe this actually is part of the definition of data but like data that can be measured and the feminine will be more focused on intuition this the sensing and this goes also with uh, I've talked about this before I don't want to go on a whole thing but 
for so long because masculine has been overvalued that what is rational has been overvalued. And if it's not rational, it's been assumed to be irrational. But there is a third realm, which is the non-rational. So irrational, for the most part, is not super valuable in leadership. <laughs> rational can be valuable in leadership. So is the non-rational. For instance, I have built my business largely based on non-rational knowing. Uh, both in, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, both in terms of what I teach, like things come to me from nowhere that I can name or pinpoint or graph out just knowings or, and again, I call them knowings, but it's like, I couldn't say it. Well, I know this because dot, 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 dot. So in terms of what I actually teach, an enormous amount of it has, has come from the non-rational realm. Um, also, how I have actually developed my business has come 90%, I don't know, maybe it's more like 85% from what I would call intuition and the non-rational. Oh, this feels good. I can just sense that this is the right step. Something, there, there, something is calling me in this direction. I'm do, I don't, I can't, couldn't give you reasons why I'm choosing this, but I know it's right for me. Um, this collaboration feels good. Uh, I know in my gut, I have a, you know, the, these sort of, or, or like it lights me up. These are non-rational ways of making decisions. And they can drive some of the more rational people a little bonkers. But there's also the realm of the rational. That So I would say like in the last year, for instance, I have begun looking at my numbers much more clearly. That's a very rational realm and it has served me incredibly well. So the non-rational realm is not more valuable than the rational realm. But again, if we look at what is tended to be um, assumed to be useful or valuable or good leadership, like if it's not rational, it's assumed to be irrational. And so the non-rational has sort of, is like the baby that's been thrown out with the bathwater of the irrational. And they're both really valuable. And most of the people, I mean, I can't speak for, you know, big business in the United States, but again, I don't actually know that how much big business is truly successful if they had to, you know, pay the actual environmental costs, if they didn't have tax loopholes, like if they had to exist like real humans do, I don't know how successful or how financially successful they would actually be. I have my doubts. And so I don't know that they're the best places to, to look at this, but in terms of the actual human beings that I know who I could look at in metrics of success, both from the financial to the you know, impact, like the, the span of impact, but also to whole, you know, success of like life wholeness, all of those people are at, they have some connection to the non-rational to the intuitive, to the feeling and the sensing. They also have, you know, what's the, the masculine, they have structure. Um, they, ha they, they actually do look at data and the rational realm. And so both are employed. And this is actually, it's one of the reasons that I wanna talk about this and why I believe it's so important to teach this. I have two programs this year actually that will bring all of this into play in a very like personalized way. Um, they're only for women right now, but one is Fierce Grace, the Fierce Grace Incubator, which is actually launching this spring, so I'll drop a little thing in the comments about that, and then one is in the fall, Radiant Leadership, and they're really looking at the value of both, and, and in individuals, so part of the reason that I want to teach this is that I see where the pendulum swings and people who can see who we might have alignment around that there is a lack of both female and feminine leadership in the world. I see sort of um, like women's leadership development, but trying to get women all on board with masculine energetics in order to get more women leadership into play. Like, okay, well, if we can just get the women like a little bit more into the masculine, then we can get women into leadership. So that's one realm I see. And I'm just like, oh, 
no, there's got to be a better way. But the other realm that I see is then like, okay, so let's just teach feminine leadership. And it's basically another way, again, of saying women should only be in their feminine, which I think is bullshit. Um, but also it doesn't serve. It actually doesn't serve because there is no human that should always be in their masculine or always be in their feminine. That is unhealthy. <laughs> it is not how we're made and it is not effective in the world. So for like to, to truly empower women into leadership, I strongly, strongly, strongly believe that it is about uh, developing, cultivating, and honoring the feminine energetics, developing, cultivating, and honoring the more healthy and sacred masculine energetics, especially. Because most people in this culture have gotten pretty good at like our toxic masculine to come in and be like, just shut down the feeling, you know, just shut down the non-rational, just make a structure, you know, put it in your calendar, set up your, you know, make your, your morning routine airtight and then like you'll have success. And I don't, I don't believe that that's actually the most effective, especially in the realm of truly developing like powerful feminine leadership in the world. So going back to like on the masculine side and the feminine side, so the masculine form would be commitment, right? I make a commitment, I keep my commitment. And there is real value to that. On the feminine side, I would say it's devotion, where we say like, okay, what am I deeply devoted to? And that will guide my commitment. Because if I tap into what I'm most deeply devoted to, my commitments will fall in line around it. Um, the masculine, this, this goes a little bit more high level, but as an energetic, I think often you can feel that the, the masculine is more connected to death. And there's some, there's a beautiful, or there's a beauty to that. And what it does, it's, it's almost connects to the efficiency piece, which is like, we're all going to die. Let's just get this shit done. You know, like, what do we need to do now? That's a, that's a masculine energetic that, it, that can be very beautiful. There can also be kind of a nihilistic, like, if, if we're unconsciously sort of connected to death, it's a little bit like, who the fuck cares if we pollute the rivers? Let's just make a profit now. So there's a, there's a, it can be a little myopic in terms of focused on the moment. And that's, I believe that that's actually the masculine awareness of death, but unconsciously and probably some fear around it, but there's a connection there actually to death that stays to the present moment that allows us to do shit like frack, you know, and like kill our rivers for prop, like in the moment profit. Like, <laughs> like that's just bizarre. The feminine cannot do that. Is the feminine perspective, and again, this is men, women. I'm sure there are actually women in leadership in those companies, but in a man or a woman, the feminine is more connected to life, which, which inherently looks at longevity. And so again, it, like we could see the obvious benefit to that. And there is, again, this, this, it's beautiful. And then sometimes it's a pendulum swing, but this idea of looking seven generations in the future. And then sometimes what that does, especially for people who have a little bit more of a feminine essence or live in the feminine, but haven't really cultivated either some sacred masculine around or within that or are unconscious of how to really use their feminine for the highest good is that that can end up being like, well, I just can't do anything because how am I ever going to take everything into consideration or everything I do has some negative concept. Like if I'm actually connected to all of life, and, and, and kind of getting um, lost in that. So it becomes, where is the beautiful dance between holding a, a really, truly conscious awareness of death and at the same time, this like beautiful conscious awareness of life. And when we can actually hold those at the same time, I am both dying and I'm living. I am, you know, all that is, is dying and regenerating at the same time. It's, it's the connection, this is kind of high level again, but between like, so stillness and movement, like in this moment, we can be more aware of all that is still. We can become more still. 
we can also, we could be more still, like I can be more still and aware that even in all that seems like stillness, there is so much movement. So that's holding both the masculine perspective and the feminine perspective at the same time, allowing them to dance um, together. I'm going to pause for just a moment here. So I think it's important to say again, I, you know, I really, I do come from the perspective that right now in our world that we actually, we really actually do need more female leadership because the, um, the I wanted to say the story of, but what I really mean is the stories, like the cultural stories, the mythology, the, the language, the experience of what it is to move through the world in a female body is right now it's considered other from the norm. Even if, if consciously one would never say it's abnormal, it's considered just like you would have, um, when I was actually reading that book that I was talking about, Ani DeFranco's memoir, she was referencing back in like the eight, the late nineties when there were women's music sections in like record stores. And I don't really think that's true anymore. You know, so we do, we see progress, but you can see the way that that's still talked about. It's like, there's like books on uh, leadership development and then there's women's leadership development. It's like, why, why are those two separate things? <laughs> and that's the way that very subtly the female or the woman's perspective to move, is moving through the world is considered other. It's considered uh, like a like a side pocket of you know the norm, rather than. And it's not even that the women's perspective should be the norm, but it should be considered that there that there is a human perspective, and that it you know fifty one percent of that is female, <laughs> or who knows where we're going with sort of non binary and not identifying as either male or female. But it's not necessarily male. Let's put it that way. So there is a truth to that. I also believe, and somebody commented on when I when I just um, uh, announced that I was going to do this live, and I announced the topic of it. Somebody said something to the effect of like, "Good point," and I don't know. I don't even know if I want to bring this in here, but I will. Um, they said Bernie, for instance, Bernie Sanders actually displays more feminine energetics than and they said Clinton, who's obviously not even running this year, but we can't stop fucking talking about her. <laughs> It's because everybody hates a masculine woman, um, but then Hillary Clinton. And the tricky piece about that, again, is that there's a lot of people who would say, like, well, we need Bernie more in office because he's more feminine than we need Hillary, who's actually a woman. And it's a, a toss-up. I'm not going to come down on either side about that, except to say that I really do believe that we actually need both right now. So we need men or we need humans who have the capacity, who have cultivated their uh, healthy and sacred masculine capacities and their healthy and sacred feminine capacities. And we need to see in male bodies that it is, that it will be honored and revered and um, valued in the ways that we value things in this culture through attention and success and money and accolades that we will value feminine capacity in a male body. We also need to see that we will actually value masculine capacity in a female body and that we will value feminine capacity in a female body. That we can value the one in us, not the one human, but the one in us that holds the more disparate focus, the more broad focus, the more long-term focus, that we can also honor the one in us that has the, the efficiency focus or the one-pointed, that the dance between those two, the meeting between those two is actually where we will find the most effective the most effectiveness. 
sometimes in the moment, sometimes long term. Um, that we can honor the one in us that is more completion oriented, that can actually see something through to the end, that can see what the end is and not get you know, caught all along the way, but that we can also honor the one in us that is process oriented that goes like, oh no, we actually do, this is not, this is not a delay. I mean, it might be a delay in like the effectiveness of getting or the, the efficiency of the goal oriented piece, but it's an important delay. This is gonna make us, this is gonna make our end result more true, more beautiful, more, uh, more of what we actually intend it to be. The one in us that actually, you know, really will look at the thing itself and how to create the thing, the, the product, the program, the meeting, the, you know, that, that, can, that can actually look at that and the specifics of it, but also the one who can feel what is the energetic of this and is it aligned with what we say the thing is, the masculine perspective and the feminine perspective. We need men and women who can do both of these things. We need the capacity to honor the rational and the non-rational. And not only to give lip service to these things, but to begin to uh, honor and value in the ways that we show that in our culture, the energetics of something as well as the structure of something. Um, a colleague of mine said something I thought was brilliant that had to do with people pay for structure. I think there's a real truth to that. And I believe that they actually pay for energy, they just don't know it. And they, I don't even know that they always know they're paying for structure either, but we, we, we can change that in our own selves by honoring through our time, through our attention, through our uh, following or likes or however we give praise through our money that which puts the energy into the world that we want in the world, as well as that which creates the structure in which to hold the energy. <laughs> and in ourselves, especially as women, and this is, I mean, I feel really, um, I have a deep value around and I feel committed to continuing to cultivate this in men and women, but I feel like a deep, deep calling to support cultivating this in women. And again, I'll put information about the Fierce Grace Incubator, which is specifically around this kind of cultivation in women. Uh, it's a small group mentorship program. And again, I actually like this word effectiveness, right? Like it's not necessarily always the most efficient, but so that we can be the most deeply effective, both in our families, in our relationships, in our business, in putting out what needs to be put out into the world. But I feel really like it's so important for women to have these skills today because we need both more feminine leadership, but we also need more female leadership in the world today. So I want to just check my notes here. <laughs> and if there's any last comments, questions, shares, you know, you can tell me this was fantastic and brilliant and you totally agree, or you can tell me, like, I think you're full of shit, Kendra, and this is why I disagree. Um, any of that in these last few minutes before I sign off. Oh, yeah, there was this piece I wanted to say at the beginning where I was sort of specifically talking about, I, you know, I think the masculine, even though we still, like, culturally we overvalue the masculine or we tend to... Um, give more weight and to the value of the masculine energetic in the world today. Uh, there's also this way that, that in the, the realms in which the masculine and the feminine is being talked about more, which is why I use these terms because they're coming alive right now. And so I use them because they're being used and I want to distinguish and clarify pieces that I believe are really important. But there's also this tendency to kind of vilify the masculine. And so I think it's really important to go like, hey, all the negative things in the world are not the masculine. <laughs> and, at, and by the same token, the feminine does not equal like all good things. 
And so, again, if we kind of look at what we might call mainstream culture, we can absolutely see where it's these feminine or these masculine energetics that tend to receive all the praise and be valued financially and through success and through fame and what have you. But there's also this way that we can see within the subculture that is engaged in the realm of masculine and feminine, there is a tendency to equate the feminine with like all good things. Like, well, that was the masculine and now I'm just gonna be in the feminine or like, we just need the feminine. And we don't, we need healthy and sacred masculine and we need healthy and sacred feminine. And we truly, we really need to cultivate these energetics within ourselves. And again, I feel most strongly drawn to cultivating them within women and females right now, because I also believe that the stories, the experience, the actual, the voice uh, of what it is to move through the world in a woman's body, in a female body, hasn't been heard enough in the last several centuries. Julie said, I often wondered how agency as a masculine trait got related to stillness, emptiness, structure, as in how are the two a natural team? The context you made of the masculine being more centering around death and the points you made there uh, put a lot of sense to it. Oh, good. I'm glad. <laughs> um, I can see what you're saying, that the, within agency, there's kind of like a movement and the stillness, emptiness piece doesn't necessarily, but there's this, there's, this isn't the right word. There isn't maybe like a really good word for this, but the separateness that kind of comes from being the structure, it, you know, it connects with agency, right? Like a certain aloneness. And that's different from all that exists within the container or that kind of interdependent interplay of like, we are to, we're all like inside the container together, everything that happens forever and ever, that kind of arising. And that's the communion aspect. And again, you know, perhaps there are truths to some of this being mapped over and to many or most women or females and many or most males or, or men. And some of that I think also is just cultural. And so there's a way, I mean, and I've written about this as well, but like agency within relationship gets a bad rap and sort of like men then get a bad rap in that realm. Whereas like in the realm of business and success, like agency is lauded and applauded and sort of communion is like, you know, well, that's not going to make us any money. <laughs> um, one last example and just see if there's any, any other questions, shares, comments before I sign off here is that I was having um, like a, like a voicemail conversation. So we weren't talking in person, but back and forth in voicemails with a friend of mine recently, who's a woman and a coach. And she was talking about wanting to feel more generous to like outsource her clients to other teachers, coaches, and facilitators when she thinks they have something of value. Specifically, she had a client that she thought would really benefit from my no man diet and didn't refer her client to me because she was afraid she would lose her client. She was like, she was saying, I just don't feel like I'm at the place where I can do that right now. And I realized inside of that, it was like this assumption that this in, in communion, this in, like in generosity would be assumed uh, to have a financial loss. It's like assumed that if she sends her client to me just for this one specific program, that suddenly like it's going to be a loss rather than actually that cultivating more financial success, which is actually what I've seen. And I know, again, in the realm of big business, I don't sort of know enough in that realm to really speak to it, but I also, you know, I have my doubts and I want to put like this little pinprick into, I, I think there's so much government subsidy and so many tax loopholes and so many bailouts and so many places where what we call big business or what have you is not actually paying for what they would need to pay for if they were if they had to run a business the way that I have to run a business, for instance, that I don't think we can actually compare or use those as metrics 
Um, but what I've actually seen in my, first of all, in my own business, but also just to be completely honest in places where, for instance, if another teacher has hired me to come in as like a guest teacher and I've thought like, Oh, I bet some of their people will come over to me. I've actually found this not true. And it's not that I don't gain something from it. It's not like, well, that's a complete wash and I should never go guest teach because it doesn't get me anything. But I've noticed that, that, people have a lot of loyalty and I don't think it's like conscious loyalty. Like I chose this person as my teacher and now they're just my teacher because I feel loyal. I think that there really is this, like my people are my people and your people are your people. And, um, and for the most part, if we really let ourselves like the truth of who we are shine through, like our people will find us and their people will find them and there'll be some interplay across the board but we won't really lose our people and that place of where is it interdependent and actually like generosity just creates more abundance for all of us i've actually seen that to be true over time yeah so i know some of you are just joining me but i am just about to sign off here so i really hope you go back to the beginning and watch the replay and i hope you comment and let me know what you think and bring any questions, shares, um, curiosities, anything that comes up as you're watching it. I would love to hear. This is a topic that is near and dear to my heart. And, and then and again, especially, well, I mean, men, if you happen to know a woman who you think would be really interested, maybe just tag her in this live so that she can get a feel for me. Um, but coming up at the end of April, I am beginning my Fierce Grace Incubator program that really is specifically for women in terms of the, cult, the full cultivation of our masculine leadership and our feminine leadership. And it's not just if you're in business or just if you're a leader or just if you're a teacher, facilitator, or coach, but really in the realm of like how do we cultivate both female and feminine leadership? in the world and that is in our relationships and in our families and in how we uh, engage with each other in the earth and in our communities as well as real true deep lasting success in our businesses whether we run our own businesses or we work in a larger company or a corporation or work for other people like these pieces apply and I have worked with too many people in too many different layers of like management to um, like, we all have capacity to lead no matter where we are in the hierarchy, whether, you know, like I own my own business. So it might seem obvious where these things play out in leadership. I have absolutely seen it in parenting. Also, like there's this thing I see in, you know, what's often called middle management where they often think like, well, I'm not the leader, but I have to lead these people. And so they feel sort of sandwiched and like fucked in the middle, if you will. And I actually believe that that kind of middle management level has the most power to impact the culture of a business. And you, if you're the one watching, like you're some of my favorite people because that it like, like to actually get to create a culture of management that you believe in for the people that you are managing. And like, I don't know, topping from the bottom, if you will, towards like upper management, like that is such a fun game. So all of these capacities that I talked about, we all already have all of them. It's about whether we've tapped into them, whether we've cultivated them, whether we're not comfortable, because sometimes it can be uncomfortable, but our, our willingness to express them regardless. And even though we all have them already, it's like, can other people feel them in us? And are we willing to maybe lean into discomfort in order to embody and to express those parts of ourselves, in order to bring that at whatever place we are in our family, in our community, in our job, in our business, what have you. Um, you know, at, at the highest level in service of changing the world. Let's do it together. All right, sending you lots of love. Ciao.